this is my class and uh, my SP4 class, which is Introduction to Painting. There's also um, numerous other students here. A lot of them are from other SP4 classes, like Mr. Staley is joining us. Um, and he has his class. He's like, I don't really understand it, but he's sort of streaming his class and watching it together. Right. And I think that Ms. Park has a lot of her students joining. I also invited my anatomy and graphic novel students to join who are upperclassmen. And as you know, it was posted on the PA. So who knows if a lot, of, like anybody could be here, who knows? <laughs> Let's just hope we don't get bombed, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't um, I'm happy to be here with this extended class in the LaGuardia community. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, so yeah, we're so lucky to have you and um, we're excited to uh, have you. We've already looked at your website and the students have come up with some great questions for you, but we're excited to have you tell us um, about being an artist and your process and, and all of that. So thank you. Um, is it a good time for me to start or where are we with uh, letting people in, I guess. Yeah, I'm still letting people in, but I think you can start anytime and I'll just keep on letting people in as they come. Sure. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen, get that working. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, um, you know, I guess I want to start by um, uh, mentioning that um, I, I was painting and drawing when I was in high school. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful um, to my um, high school art teachers, also my middle school teachers, um, but there were a huge influence um, in what I did um, when I was young. And mostly I followed their path and they were painters. So my emphasis was painting and drawing. And if you had looked at my website, you could see that I do all sorts of other things, but you, um, <clears throat> I want to emphasize that painting was so critical to my training and drawing and how I perceive the world, how I imagine and make careful observations. So I think um, my training as a painter really informs the kind of uh, larger practice I have in installation and site specific projects. So I want to uh, cue you in into that, like what is a painting process and how does it look, even if you're not quote painting, right? Um, so I left painting a while um, after attending college um, and moved into installation. But since you are in high school, I wanted to mention just like how important those great teachers are as mentors and models, right? Um, and um, for me, uh, doing figure drawing, um, painting, um, still lives and um, life drawings um, were really where I was grounded and I did portraiture, I also painted the outdoor landscape a lot. In fact, my uh, senior portfolio was a series of paintings in this winter landscape. So I was literally outside uh, in plein air painting fr from the outdoors. And that was my quote, senior portfolio as well as um, some self portraits. Um, you know, in, in, in high school, those, um, my portfolio ended up, you know, being submitted to scholastics and young arts. And these are amazing opportunities just to, think about what is my work, even at that early age and put a portfolio together. So just even applying is a, a, a mini, amazing learning tool. So I encourage you to do that, you know. Um, thankfully, I, I was awarded um, uh, prizes and recognition very early and I got a full ride to Pratt Institute where I teach. So just a grounding of all the kind of spaces that um, an arts background can lead you. Um, that was so important to me. But I wanted to b begin by saying the body. You know, the figure drawing really allowed me to translate my work into the love of the body. And that may translate into what does our identity look like? You know, um, what does community look like? Um, what does our society look like? Um, and then, of course, the translation of um, love for landscapes. It's really about our environment and ecology 
um, and leading to environmental um, ideas around uh, climate change. Um, so, so it was all there in the early high school passion. It just evolved into these larger interests as I had opportunity. Um, so I wanted to begin with one of my first installations that I did. And this project really allowed me to get off the wall and go on the floor to make these sculptures. Um, if you look very carefully, it might be hard to tell what this is, but they're an everyday object that we just don't think about and disregard, but it's really closely related to the body. Um, these are pant cuffs that you alter and you throw out. And of course, I'm not standing in front of you, but if you were, you know, um, my son would be much taller than I am. I'm a very small, petite person. And so this idea of the body being a specific measurement was so interesting to me that it was my body, but somehow I had to stand to a standard of fashion and how it didn't stack up to an American pair of jeans. So then I kept thinking, well, what is that exact measurement that I always have to deal with? and discard. So it was unnecessary, this scrap of fabric, and it was unnecessary for me to compare with the standard because um, I felt like this, the standardization was the problem, not my height. Um, so I started to think about this excess. And so I had drawers full of this over the years of cutting my pants off or rolling them, and then realized the alteration shops also had dozens, dozens, hundreds of these leftover fabrics. So I bartered with them, could I take them? Could I do something for them? Could I purchase them? They're like, oh my God, I would just be throwing this out. Scrap material, going to the landfill, go, you know, just pick them up. So I started to collect them and, and, and you could see these jeans and some of them are like someone who tailored a millimeter or a centimeter off their jeans and others had two feet worth of height deficiency, um, but really, they're not deficient at all. It's really the absence of these things um, that I wanted to bring a, our attention to. So it's a unit of measure. And I'm sure when you are thinking about proportion, you're thinking about how does one unit measure to a, another unit. And that's exactly what this project really is, you know, but to think about in the absence of units that don't exist in reality because we quickly remove them. Um, so these are pant cuffs that have been stiffened with wax. So they look like volumes at a distance, but they're actually empty. Um, and then earlier projects allowed me to move from, quote, the space of the painting um, wall and onto the ground, but also then going outside. And those early experiments of my work uh, shifting to other spaces really helped me to learn about the possibilities where my art could exist. Um, so these are umbrellas. And in storms, um, I was seeing that this appendage to our body to protect us from rain um, were um, quickly being abandoned, literally, like people were running to get shelter and it would abandon this object. And I thought these objects were so beautiful um, and that, that the umbrella themselves come in all these beautiful colors. And this is where painting comes to life. You know, um, setting up a palette was one of those first important things. If you have as many colors as possible, if you don't, you mix it, you know, but found color could be anywhere in our world, um, even the discarded. And that in the streets, uh, after a heavy storm, people would just abandon and run shelter and leave behind these beautiful umbrellas, um, these beautiful shapes and colors. And I thought, wow, I could make a painting existing out of the palette of these found umbrellas. So I'd sewed them together, um, but I also consider them as rescuing them from, again, the landfill and, and uh, quickly tried to get them before uh, the sanitation department picked them up on the corners of the street. And I deconstructed them and then would create these big canopies. Um, of course, they're bigger than my studio ever were, you know, but my outdoor projects um, anchored between some trees and a landscape, both horizontally and vertically. Um, and what it gave me working outdoors was uh, uh, the energy in, uh, of the sun, which allowed these beautiful shadows to happen, but also the wind. And so then it came alive. So I didn't imagine, I, I thought they were kind of like painted surfaces that I was sewing together, but in fact, it became a kinetic sculpture, um, a, a new environment that people would hang um, underneath um, the shade of this canopy. And people just hang out uh, because they wanted shade. Um, it was a beautiful place where people took a picnic and 
chase the uh, shadows and so on. So nature provided me a beautiful surprise, something that I would not have anticipated in the control of the studio. So in some way, we think of painting as something like, I wanna master it and I wanna learn to control. And I realized after having painted so many years, I said, you know, I'm actually interested in what we can't control. I'm interested in the little happy accidents when something doesn't happen the way I want it to be and to appreciate that and to see maybe I can make a whole work about that. Um, and this work was pretty much that. Um, what makes it so alive is its environment how it moves with the unexpected um, chance encounter with the wind. Um, when I started to show my work in these alternative spaces and um, nonprofits in New York, um, I also was embedded working at the Whitney Museum um, in curatorial practices. I have a degree in art history. So after I got, I got my BFA, I studied um, a master's degree. And that art history uh, is also really important because you can see these references to art historical works in my practice for sure. Um, but I had the opportunity to have my first museum show at the Museum of Modern Art um, through a colleague and who is a curator. And so, um, since I was doing these found object installations, I thought, well, what a uh, momentous occasion for me to rethink about my practice to be uh, more engaged um, and make a little shift. And that shift was really not to find these materials myself, but to, um, to call for this material through a community. So since I had this wonderful curator working with me to realize this project, I had had, had her uh, go out and ask the museum staff to give me their work clothes. So this was at the Museum of Modern Art in their QNS, the Queen Space, um, when they were renovating the Midtown um, Manhattan space. So I really thought about the people who worked there and how they were commuting to a different site and how they were sort of, um, they lost their office spaces and just, um, in all these isolated little rooms all over Queens. Um, and so I was thinking about this community fragmented. And so I took their clothes that they donated for the project and, and started to deconstruct them um, like the fashion, um, the patterns that would generate their clothes. So I was removing the seams, the stitch from the fabric. And so these two parts, just like the umbrella that has structure and, and then the, um, the fabric that shelters, um, they're really quite different and one can be extremely flat. And for me, this is a nod to Matisse, um, one of my favorite collections and artists at the MoMA um, uh, permanent collection, but in particular, not his paintings, which I've always loved, but his uh, collages. So I took this clothing and thought of a life-size collage on the wall where different people's pants and shirts could align. And it's like a big puzzle, you know, but it really is painting. I'm taking these pieces and reformatting them. And all of this is done digitally. I photograph each one of them and make this huge digital uh, illustrator file um, to scale. And so then when I'm on site, I have sort of a drawing to follow um, so I can reconstruct this painting in real scale at the museum. Um, those projects then inspired people to ask me to do these permanent works um, because the exhibitions would go on for four months, but then these sites would be given permanently to this work. So I took that MoMA project and really re-envisioned other communities, not just people who worked at a museum under the MoMA kind of time period, but who are other communities who are loosely um, together, but that the art project would define them for a moment. And um, the federal government had asked me to do a percent for art project. And um, ironically, it was in Baltimore where my parents and I had immigrated and we uh, migrated from Korea. Um, so we were naturalized in this building. So our family history were tied to this. And so one of their big users of the building is uh, people who would get their citizenship, immigrants. And then the other user was US veterans. So I thought that was so interesting that these two incredible um, populations, communities would be all going through the same space where my art would be and how to capture that. Um, so I asked the veterans to give me their clothes and worked with um, the U.S. Veterans Administration um, to get old soldiers to give me um, their clothes that they saved. And then I um, 
had the opportunity to work with um, the immigration services. And this was different population because they don't have an email list. They don't know who they're, who they're dealing with until the day they get their citizenship. So before they started to begin their ceremonies, they just gave me the floor and said, here's Jean Shen inviting you to do a public art project with them. <laughs> and so I, of course, was so reminded of our own family history coming to this country and their long journey. Uh, the journey has become more complex over the years. Uh, the populations have shifted from being Asian to African, um, uh, from uh, Latin countries. So it was really, really amazing to connect um, with the people who were making this journey at that time. So I invited them to participate by giving me an article of clothing in which their uh, family can celebrate this journey and see um, their bodies, quote, represented in this public work. So this man from Greece actually gave me his shirt and signed up right there, <laughs> but others would then mail me their shirts. And this is obviously a veteran who um, then also sent me their uniform, but also what they look like when they were in service um, to the US. And these are incredible different uh, populations of the United States, someone who um, decides to um, sacrifice their life in service for the country wearing this uniform and then getting shipped to uh, all over the world. And then others who so want the American dream of citizenship and come from the world and become citizens today. Um, so I just thought it was this voyage of people, the migration of people that the project could capture. So you can see how figure, the figure and movement is still in my work. Um, and then I thought of other strategies of how clothing can be a surrogate for the body, can be a surrogate for our identity, can be surrogate for people um, and histories. Um, so when Asia Society and Museum decided uh, that they were going to put together an exhibition, I um, thought it was an interesting question around my own Asian identity and uh, the curators and this community that they were trying to um, showcase. So I asked the curators, um, who were all Asian American, to uh, give me one of their sweaters and then enlist the people that they were part of and to ask them uh, for a sweater for the project. Um, this project is called Unraveling, where I map this community that I was not familiar with yet. Um, and so they gave me their sweater and unlike knitting, um, I was deconstructing their sweaters and using it as a material that I could unravel and get back to its material essence, the line. So when you knit, you start with a ball, which is a line that then you create a form that would fit a body. Um, and here I was really connected not to the person, but how as a community, we are all interconnected. And in particular, I was struck by this idea of how many degrees of separation are we from someone else? I know that's the uh, it's all how many degrees of separation are we from Ke um, Kevin Bacon, but today in the internet and certainly with, you know, Facebook, Instagram and um, um, all your social media forms, you know, we're more interconnected than we ever were. Um, so how we know each other is really different, but this project happened even before there was social media. So I actually didn't know beyond knowing these curators, if I knew people who were really central to the Asian American arts community. So this project allowed me not only for them to share with me their sweater and don't have that donation, but also they shared with me who they knew in this network work. So then I could start to map out um, through their thread, the person that they knew would be interconnected in this kind of what I call the hive of Asian American communities. And as the project continued to move from site to site, uh, it would be dismantled, unraveled, and then recreated. And so it moved across the country from New York, um, all through um, LA, and then finally to um, Honolulu. And then local communities were invited every single time the project moved to a different city. And you could, the, the network works expanded and um, the complexity of this growing network over the years is what I wanted to map. Basically mapping the invisible, um, how we know each other and our relationships are really, really complicated and, and hard to uh, recognize. Whereas a person standing in front of you wearing a sweater is easier to, to sort of quote map, but how they're related to someone else is um, an impossible task because it's fluid, it's in flux, 
our relationships grow, expand, sometimes um, get distant. Um, and so this idea of uh, building a community around uh, the project was what I was interested in. Um, I wanted to show an earlier project, um, like when I was doing the pant cuffs, I was really into mapping other accessories of the body. And um, I thought of shoes, something that people take for granted granted. Um, and in particular, leather shoes. Um, I took all the leather and thought, oh, here's this fashion that comes actually from another body, not our own, but from animals. So I thought of like, oh, the animals had to sacrifice their own skin so that we could protect our feet, uh, like moccasins. Um, so this idea of creating a pelt or a skin. Um, so I collected all these shoes and deconstructed them. So I took a three-dimensional object that we insert our bodies into and created back to a two-dimensional form um, and then reconnected one pair to make a singular unit um, and then tried to connect them to other brown shoes, other men's shoes, other typologies, you know, getting it back to, quote, the animal, uh, the whole, how we deconstructed this body, you know, and made it uh, part of our consumer um, uh, fashionable, uh, trendy needs, but really, what is it? What is this material that we take for granted? And what was the sacrifice um, in order for us to cover our fate or to be, quote, in fashion? Um, and then also what was hidden behind it? So um, the leather was obviously visible. That's what, how we choose our shoes. But in fact, if you look underneath our shoes, it tells a different story. So first, the heel. So it was a gendered story, women having to quote, wear here heels or want to wear heels and how discomforting it was to lift your feet up in these insanely pointed um, shapes. So um, I was showing this, but also the underside of the sole shows the wear and tear. So every single time you take a step, it's like creating a drawing. You're creating a mark on that leather. And some who walk a lot, their shoes are totally worn and if not um, have holes in them. And others who just barely walk, um, go from car to car or chauffeured around or barely wear these shoes um, are barely scuffed. And so this notion of drawing uh, on the soles of one's feet and mark making, the labor of walking were all sort of uh, the the things I wanted to reveal um, in this project. Um, so we go from that project um, to the next, um, which is, you know, just mapping uh, the shoes on the feet and they're like uh, footprints, you know, which is beautiful metaphor in the snow, right? Uh, it talks about who was here before us, um, those beautiful marks and embedded in the landscape and how the souls were a passage of people, a crowd that could fill um, just by signifying where their shoes could be left. Um, but they were definitely remnants of and representing people. Um, I also wanted to, uh, those are a lot of projects that really dealt with clothing. So I want to shift gears that a lot of my other practice is about things that you find on the street and being inspired by it. Um, so in my walks from the studio uh, to my house, in my commute, I would always be inspired by what's around me. You know, in the time of boredom, before we had phones, I'd be just looking down to see what would be material source and what would lead my curiosity. And I would find these little scraps of color on the street and there were lotto tickets. Um, there are instant um, scratch and win, you know, kind of gambling um, uh, at the cost of a dollar. Um, and of course, when I picked them up, these beautiful colors were losers. People throw them out because, damn, I didn't win. You know, I'm going to try tomorrow because I, I feel like I should win tomorrow. Maybe this was not my chance. So this kind of embedded I idea that you can be a winner. Um, and, I, and yet these cards are losing and lost in and then discarded. So I took the potential that was um, then uh, released on the street and collected them. And I thought of them as units of dollars. Um, in particular, I thought, oh my God, if I could collect dollars just th being thrown out, that would be one amazing thing. But that in my studio, I was similarly doing that. Um, I was making a work and then it didn't work out. You know, um, like so many of my experiments, like you had to make many of them to have one success successful, you know? So a whole day in my studio would be like, meh, didn't work. It felt like, oh, I know that feeling like that ticket, 
you scratch and you lose, <laughs> but it doesn't mean you're a loser. You really have confidence. I'm going to win the next one. So I'm going to go back to the studio, go back into that work or make a new work, you know? And I really thought that kind of risk um, and the notion that like, it's okay to quote lose because it's not about losing. It's about the search and the process. So these um, tickets are making the structure, which I call like chance city. Um, and it's held by uh, just gravity and friction. So it's like a house of cards. So there is no guarantee that it's going to win, right? Because if you knew your work was going to be successful from the beginning, it probably is so formulaic and so predictable that it's probably not that interesting, you know? So what's interesting is that you kind of have to challenge yourself and go to the discomfort, to your edge, to the point where it might collapse or fall apart, but then just at that point, you've got something interesting. And that's what's so the beautiful tension of the work. And I felt like Chance City did that. And what was it made out of? All the potential losses that people felt, but that I gathered those potential losses and, and put them together. Um, as people say, if you have lemons, if you're handed lemons, make lemonade, you know? Um, so this is um, a assistant of mine during a major Smithsonian exhibition starting the Chance City process. It's like a performance. It takes so much time and labor, weeks, of us at the end, there were five of us all building um, and she got us started at that corner. So it's about the labor, right? Over time, if you invest your energy and your due diligence, you'll make it pass through all those quote losing tickets. As most people know, if you play, you know, $10 a day, then eventually over a year you win, <laughs> right? Because your chances are better. Right? And art is just like that, showing up as half the game and uh, doing the work is half the game. And then you'll be lucky enough to just see something magical happen where you're like, oh, I won instantly. But you didn't really win instantly. You actually spent a lot of time practicing um, for that moment to be uh, something you recognize. Um, so I wanted to talk about this found quality and the chance encounter um, of the street because these works, um, I mean, you know, I came from a painting background and I was going to a construction site for a public art project I was opening for the Second Avenue subway, which didn't open for like seven years. So I would visit the site every day and they had these construction fences around uh, where the public could still ride the subway, but they were doing construction on the other side. And they uh, paint these subway um, panels construction blue. And then over the years, I saw them wear and tear and graffiti artists would tag them and then the maintenance workers would have to paint them over. And I was like, oh my God, they're painting. And look at this beautiful paint. Um, and so I took some pictures and over the years I was documenting the painting process that was happening through erasure. Um, and this whole question around who is allowed to be an artist and how the graffiti artists wanted to express themselves on a surface that they didn't have permission to. And so they were, quote, erased by someone who had paint and not um, a spray paint or um, marker. So I just thought this notion of drawing, painting, different bodies who unintentionally would respond and react to each other was the painting process. You know, you put something on, you raise something, you put a shape, you put a line, <laughs> and then you keep going and the layers that that happen. Sometimes you get a tear and it's really quite beautiful. Um, and so I, I decided that that was going to be my painting, that there were incredibly uh, found works that my labor was not at all in it except to extract them. And I literally had to steal them from MTA because uh, they said they would promise to, it to me, but they actually didn't have the time or the labor to remove them. So I secretly went down there <laughs> and removed them myself. So the extraction was my own labor because quote, I had permission, but technically I wasn't allowed to be there. Um, so this idea of like, who owns this thing? Uh, this painted surface, who um, recognizes its beauty, and who unintentionally uh, continues to help that process along. And so I thought of this as like the beautiful abstract um, artists, like abstract expressionists, but also Monet and this beautiful blue. Um, and so when, some, when I showed this piece, people said, oh my God, it's so amazing that I didn't know you painted. <laughs> or I didn't know you went back to painting. And I just said, well, painting is everywhere, 
right? Even on the streets and even with people who don't think they're painting, uh, they are. Um, so I wanted to show this, the beauty of the accidental painting. Uh, and speaking of that color, the color that was irresistible, this is color called Celadon. And uh, it's a color that was really deep in my cultural heritage. So Celadon, the history of Celadon comes from um, ceramics. Um, it's a dye that one would use to pigment your, um, your pottery. And uh, it has a very, very long history coming from China, past to Korea and Japan. And each variation of the uh, um, cultures has a slight shift and um, most Korean um, uh, arts and, uh, and craft is celebrated and lands on uh, Korean celadon as being the heightened importance of our culture. So when I was invited to do a public art project in Queens, New York, which you can still see, um, it's the uh, train station um, at the Broadway station. So it's very much like you're walking around in Seoul. Um, and whenever I visit, I feel like I've just been transported to uh, uh, being in Asia. Um, and so I thought, what can I do in this project that celebrates that cultural history and to be in dialogue with the rich um, uh, community of Koreans? And um, so I decided in this project, instead of gathering material from the direct community, I would export myself to Korea back again to my birthplace. And so here I am meeting uh, the ceramic artists who are still practicing this really, really ancient art. And um, the ceramic process uh, has a double layering, uh, a firing that is really, really complicated. And so 40 to 60% of their production is flawed. There's a crack, there's a bubble, the color, the width. So can you imagine? So this is very similar to that idea that not everything you produce is gonna work out. It's not gonna be hundred percent. And these are masters in this field, you know? Um, they've been trained as a young person and grew up in this atelier, generations of training and yet, they know 40 to 60% is predictably not gonna work out. But because it's so hard, that's the beauty of the work, right? For them to get that perfection. But for me, I was like, really? What about the other 60% that you had to throw out? That's where my work begins. Cause I said, what is flawed? Well, it's only if you want perfection. I don't care about perfection. I love that life is imperfect. I love that you can repair things. I love that, you know, you can see a flaw and recognize it. And that's part of who we are, that I'm not perfect. I'm actually not aiming for that. So I said, could, could I take your trash, the things you throw out? And they were like, of course, you know, we don't let whole things leave because we break them because we want there to be no value. And I said, oh my God, there is incredible value. There's every beauty of what you've already done, but you don't recognize it because it doesn't function, because it can't pour um, and become a vase or a teacup or a, um, a, um, a vessel. And for me, I don't need it to be a vessel. Um, I just want people to pay attention to the beauty of the celadon material itself and the fractured nature of the broken shard. Um, and for me, this was a metaphor for me and the people of Korea, diaspora, the people who have left Korea, but still part of the cultural heritage, whether you live there, whether you speak the language or not, um, your, your DNA has deep roots in a cultural history, but we're broken because we are no longer, quote, part. Uh, but in, even in our, quote, broken uh, shard or fragment of that cultural uh, heritage, we are all part of it. We share the same, quote, color. We share the same um, kind of history, whether we know it or not or recognize it later. So I wanted to um, showcase a project that feels like you just discover this huge monumental broken shard as opposed to the perfect Celadon vase. And so if you look closely, you see the male and female form um, of these beautiful um, vases that you'll see in every major museum in the world. When Korea is represented, they're represented by these two Korean Celadon vases. So again, I'm really mining art history and um, the richness of our cultural uh, makers um, in my work. So they're participating with me, um, but it's also a critique about whether we strive for perfection or we accept the flawed nature of both the art practice. Um, I'm going to still continue to go quickly, but let me know if we want to open up 
um, for questions. Um, recently, um, I've been thinking about that vessel and also mapping the body, not just in a physical form, but those invisible ways, like what's happening inside our body. You know, um, and so part of that is through consumption. You know, the saying, you are what you eat. <laughs> and of course, um, uh, the nutrition is part of that. But in our culture, we also augment our health by taking drugs. And this vessel, which are these prescription pill bottles, um, are a great way that modern medicine has altered the chemistry, the chemical um, body so quickly and effectively. And, you know, I bring this up because we're talking about the vaccine and, you know, these quick fixes that we're, this is going to cure it all, but it's like, even if there is a cure, how many people are going to take it? And are we still going to behave in ways that really help each other versus just assuming a drug is going to, quote, cure us, you know, because it's our behavior and our consumption, um, but also relying on these drugs for our nut basic nutrition. Um, we had a huge problem with, um, with addictive drugs, um, uh, uh, right before the pandemic struck, but that's that addiction still continues. And talking about addiction, it doesn't have to be, even be a heavy drug or a painkiller. Um, our basic foods are addictive. Um, so I did a project um, questioning another vessel that we consume, which are sodas. And in particular, the culprit being Mountain Dew, one of the highest uh, sugar uh, products that we have that you can consume. Um, the high fructose corn syrup is incredibly addictive. Um, and so uh, these communities were consuming a lot of it. And so this green bottle was readily available. So I used and cons um, these bottles from the community, asked uh, school children and their educators to make this project where, where they would transform um, their trash, their recyclables, into a product that they know that's in their landscape. So this is a corn, a hybrid of my version of their corn, uh, taking a Mountain Dew bottle, uh, attaching it one after the other, and then transforming them by adding these quote leaves. Um, and just the pure color makes it seem so natural. And just the name of this, the Mountain Dew makes it seem like somehow it's from nature when it's the, the most artificial kind of product you can uh, put in your body. So I also uh, was looking at their landscape and looking at their cornfields and realizing that um, though it is, quote, a farm and they're making, quote, corn, none of this is actually natural. Um, it's through pesticides and fertilizers and, and industrial um, agriculture that has nothing to do with us eating this delicious corn. Um, it's a monoculture that, you know, robs us of biodiversity and really uh, threatening our environment, just like um, us consuming Mountain Dew. It is not real food. It's empty calories. All it does is make you have diabetes, heart disease, uh, rotten teeth. The list goes on, right? Um, but our addiction and our fantasy that it's, quote, Mountain Dew, it must be refreshing. Um, so I created this labyrinth in which uh, it's a big cornfield, a maze, um, and you kind of navigate through it, and there's a lot of dead ends. Um, and it's a metaphor to our journey into um, this um, ecological crisis, but also um, the confusion around our health, you know, and our inability to get healthy natural foods in our environment. Instead, all we have is shells full of Mountain Dew and processed food. And so the connection between corn is that most of the corn in Iowa is not something we eat. Uh, it is processed into corn syrup and turned into high fructose corn syrup that is in all, all our processed foods that is in our shelves. So like the pandemic, when we're worried about our food shortage, we're not getting healthy, fresh foods. We have plenty of this uh, bad food for us and our shelves. And so I recreated this project in New York, uh, introducing that this, what feels like, oh, why is a corn in New York? It doesn't exist. Well, it did exist in indigenous cultures. Uh, Manhattan was um, full of corn uh, made in ways that honored um, nutrition and health and biodiversity. Um, but this corn that is now produced in America fills our landscape, um, uh, our recyclables, our um, toxic to our environment, uh, not recycled enough and landing in our oceans, um, harming, you know, our, our oceans, um, um, habitats. Um, 
So this is kind of a mirage, you know, it feels so green, it feels so um, refreshing, but is actually really toxic. So not letting us be deceived by what you see. Um, I wanted to end with these two projects. Um, this is where lack of color, uh, the removal of color works for me as well. Um, so I take a single object and here um, there's another uh, thematic thread, which is based on technology. And um, when I'm looking at uh, cultural waste, um, the waste stream is so full of our electronics because we upgrade so quickly. In the last 20 years, um, it is becoming such a crisis around e-waste. Um, so this is old media. Uh, and I show you this because I don't know if you'll ever um, study Japanese uh, wood blocks, but uh, they're an amazing, um, famous, great wave. Um, um, Hikatsu, and so I uh, want to reference that, and that was sort of st stuck in my mind as an early reference. So I made my own great wave made of old records um, that were donated from my family. These are vine, uh, pre vinyl, um, and so we melted them and made them fluid as if it's this big tsunami like wave that's about to hit us. Um, but that led to this idea of this my current project that I had opened during the pandemic of 2020 and I ironically called it pause because I was already feeling like we were spending too much time on our phones and our and uh, the, uh, the uh, um, personal technologies were robbing us of our attention span we could just were so distracted from um, our real physical reality um, in favor of escaping to the digital uh, social connections and so I wanted to create this work um, it was at the Asian art uh, museum in San Francisco and I was looking at scholars rocks these beautiful um, rocks that uh, are extracted from nature for us to to contemplate them, uh, often found in Zen gardens. Um, they're beautifully shaped. Um, and so it's a place for our mind to contemplate. And I thought like we were spending way too much time contemplating our phones than our realities or our nature. And so these scholars rocks are embedded with um, and surfaced with our phones. Um, so this really starts to map 20 years of how we move from the flip phone and to our um, Palm Pilots to our um, uh, um, now smartphones and uh, our screen life. And um, then we're surrounded by the cables um, that would give us connectivity. But without the software and electricity, you know, this just becomes waste um, that is toxic to our environment. And again, um, becoming a new landscape if we don't do something about it. So our race to upgrade has really created a disconnect um, with our ability to connect with ourselves, but also our ability to connect with each other really, um, because the, the phone is not a substitute for real connection. As we find out in COVID, as we're doing remote learning and remote teaching, um, it works, but it's not as, as real. Um, and the benefits of really being in the same space um, and learning from each other and um, being with each other is so different. And I wanted to show the difference of that. Um, but ironically, here we are in Zoom. <laughs> Um, so with that, um, I'm going to close out and just mention that um, if you are on 63rd Street, and um, this is my um, MTA subway station that I was telling you had opened a couple of years ago, that you can visit and see three different projects um, and, and the inspiration for this is the elevated train and archives, photographic archives from um, the New York Historical uh, Library and also the MTA Transit Museums archive. You know, so a lot of my inspiration really looks at looking at other forms of art, both art history, whether it's painting um, or printmaking, ceramics, photography, um, and kind of using some of those ideas, but also transforming it into new materials. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there, um, stop sharing screen so we can open up for questions and other engagement. 
Thank you so so much. That was a lot of information, but I wanted to throw out a lot of things and and hopefully you can see my engagement um, in painting, drawing and those themes and the idea around color and color symbolism, uh, the power of color and found color all around you. Right. It was really amazing. I just loved hearing you talk about each of your projects and it seems like um, I think a lot of times we'll go to a museum and we're like, we have no idea what that is. And I don't know, you just really, your work is so down to earth and understandable and, and it just, I don't know. And it's also really beautiful. So thank you so much. I know that we have a lot of questions. So um, yeah, why don't you guys like raise your hand in the chat and then I'll call on you and we can do yeah, and I want to emphasize, thank you so much for talking about the accessibility, because that is something that I do uh, uh, have as a, a goal of, of making art. Um, and I also love working both in the museum, which is a public space, you know, and I, but not everyone goes to museums, you know, um, my parents didn't go to a museum. So I really wanted to talk about who is the audience for art and, and make that really accessible. And that's why I do a lot of works that are in the public realm and literally permanent and train stations and subways, people who go to work can see great art, you know. Um, but I also want to talk about how my material use is also talking about the accessibility. You know, people know how to talk about Mountain Dew and soda, right? But people don't know how to talk about like um, color field paintings, right? That was like, I don't know anything about color field painting. What did you just say to me? You know, uh, you know, Eve's Klein Blue, what? What are you talking about? You know, like art has its own language and history and it can really be a barrier to people enjoying art. And so meanwhile, I can put this green in a public space and the, the security guards will come up to me like, oh, are you the artist? I want to talk to you about your work. And then when I tell them it's made of sodas, you know, they just get so excited and tell me everything that they know about this work and what it's inspired. And for me, that's the dialogue that I want to create, that anyone can have a dialogue and own that space, um, as opposed to saying like, you don't know art and you've never been surrounded by art, so therefore you can't talk about it, you know? And so I just think that my material choice allows anyone to talk about umbrellas, shoes, <laughs> and get deep conversations about shoes, <laughs> you know. Um, so for me, that's kind of the joy is to extend art to all these people who don't, and unlike you, um, don't know how to draw, I can't paint, and have given that up a long time ago and feel like they're inept and therefore art isn't in their life and they can't be creative. And I think, well, no, that's not true. That's what we're told, but anyone can have creativity in their life. And so that's kind of my, the joy of the work that I do. Yeah, I love it. The so questions. Yeah, questions, who's got some questions? Um, well, in the chat, we have a question. Uh, what do you do when you have major art block? What's your process? Um, yeah, you know, I love, I, I should mention that like research is kind of uh, what I do and taking inspiration from other things, other artists, if not every day, you know? So sometimes like, yeah, look, look on the internet, right? Go in that rabbit hole. You know, I spent like hours, thousands of weeks, you know, on a project thinking of ideas and I probably come up with 20 ideas. And not all, I know all of them are not gonna work out, you know? So it's a process of elimination, you know? So give yourself lots of options, right? As opposed to no options, right? So looking and referencing other works, things that you're inspired by, you know, also just if you have no idea, take any idea and make it work, you know? Do something you like. You know, go back to your default. What do I like? And if there's some subject you like, whether it's a favorite band or, you know, like skateboarding, like that's great. Start there and go with it with passion, right? Um, and just make it a subject. So there's no good idea or bad idea. It's what you do with it, you know? Uh, people say you can't copyright an idea. You can take good ideas like the wave and I made new art out of it. It's like, I know it's a good idea, but it's not like someone owns the wave, <laughs> you know? Um, that can't be, um, it's not your own, right? These great ideas live in all of us. Bad ideas live in all of us, you know? And so, and then another thing to do is take a walk, 
you know, go out and distract yourself, do something else. Cause we can beat ourselves to death and like come with a great idea. Well, inspiration just isn't there that day and that's okay. So go and give yourself permission to take a journey, take a walk. And I often find almost riding the subway station or attending a lecture, you know, where I'm not focused on my own crisis of imagination. Then suddenly ideas are flowing, you know, when your body is moving or there's a rhythmic, uh, train ride or someone talking to you some something triggers and your 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 unconscious mind arrives at a great place you know um yeah and then also just you know doing a lot of sketching you know go back to your former works you know so i think there's a lot of ways that creative box uh, can be unearthed um, but i would say it's probably um the the kind of pressure you put yourself you know, so either release that pressure and just start somewhere. And if you just start, something will happen. Like you'll allow chance to come in and give you a gift, you know? That's great. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Nicole asks, I really like doing those lottery scratch tickets. And yeah, it's pretty disappointing when you don't win. <laughs> I read the description of the Chance City artwork and it said that there was no glue used. So what happens if you needed to move the structure somewhere else? Because wouldn't it collapse? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it totally is about that. Like, um, there's no guarantee that it stays up. And it's just like a house of cards. Like, I was like, hmm, could a house of cards that you play as a game turn into a work? And I just said, and pe will people be invested in showing that work? And I love that um, they are. And first is because I was insane enough to spend hours and weeks making these structures and watching them in my studio. And I was like, oh, it's been there for months. I've been doing other projects, but this structure stays there like that for months because it's an engineering space where you have a vertical horizontal. So a house cards actually does work. It's the basic engineering of, of building a structure. Um, and then I love the fact that people don't think it'll work. So when they come to this piece, they're just in awe and they look so carefully. And then they're also afraid when they realize that there's no adhesive that they start, stop breathing almost. They're so sensitive around this work and they are like, oh my God, it, I might be the one who breaks this. And I just love that it brings, br brings us to such sensitivity and awareness. Um, whereas if I told them it's permanent and it's glued, everyone would be like, whatever, and just ignore it and walk with their backpacks and maybe bump into it and go, oh, whatever, I don't care. And, and so creating that vulnerability um, in the work itself made everyone else respect um, that uh, space, that they didn't want it to be ruined. But at the end of the day, Literally, we have to pick up that piece again and stack them and then put them in boxes, count them, reorganize them. And then the labor starts again when someone else wants to show it. Um, and so it is like that idea that it's very quick to imagine like something falling. Yeah, when it falls, it falls very quickly, right? Just like scratching, that's an easy part. But the impulse, it's like, okay, but it's okay. I'm okay losing this one little thing because I'm gonna keep going, right? That labor, is really hard, right? That labor, like how long can you sustain that? Um, so the piece really relies on our valuing that long-term labor, not the quick labor. Anyone can do something instantly. There's instant gratification. And we're like um, humanly um, drawn, you know, to want instant gratification. But the rewards are really in, um, mastering um, against instant to like long-term investments, you know, what is really going to help you, you know, and not um, uh, tease you into, into losing so quickly. Because <laughs> you know? once you get that instant thing, the next second, it's like, oh, it's gone. Now I need another instant gratification. And, and you know, that, that can be gambling or anything else, you know, it, it, it robs you of real uh, value. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, and I ha can I just read you all the questions and then you can either answer them. Is that okay? Sure, no. or, or yeah. Some of them are quick questions. Like okay. out of curiosity, what do you teach at Pratt? 
So um, I currently teach in um, the graduate program called Integrated Practice, which is like a multidisciplinary uh, program. So all my students work from anything like painting, sculpture, video, uh, performance, uh, you know, public works and uh, projects in the public realm where people like are interested in public art uh, interventions. Um, and then I also teach an undergraduate program, which is drawing the expanded field um, and also professional practice. Um, but historically I taught in the first year foundation for uh, almost a decade. So uh, the first core curriculum would be drawing. So we're doing still lives and landscapes and doing figure drawing. Um, and also back then it used to be light color design. Uh, so collages, color theory, and then moving into painting. Um, so I taught, I taught it all and I taught sculpture, uh, senior thesis and so on. Nice, thank you. And for your school, when you first came out of college, did your school give you any opportunities to find actual work in your field? Like, did they send you off with a job? My mother works at FIT and they help their students find work. So did your school do the same for you? Yeah, well, part of it is the, is the um, getting an internship is a really great idea, but it's not mandatory. So no school can force someone to work for another organization. Uh, so it's encouraged. And I would, because um, issues are in equity, not everyone can afford to take an internship and many internships aren't free, unfortunately. So there's a real um, issue around equity when it comes to internships, but internships are incredibly important to get your foot in the door for you to understand the field, you know, but they can't quite require it. Um, and also now professional practice, which is a course I teach is a requirement. Um, but again, we, we give you the groundwork, um, but I can't again force you to work because I don't know your work. You might already be working, so I can't ask you to take your regular job and then take another professional job. Um, so it's an option, but the requirement is professional practice and understanding the career you're entering is something that is a requirement for all our undergrad students. Awesome, thank you. And um, what, um, oh my gosh, there's like, there's so many good questions. And Mr. Staley is also texting me questions from his kids and they're good. <laughs> um, let's see, well, maybe a quick question or a quick answer is what is the most bizarre meeting you ever worked in? That's kind of fun. Wow. Um, well, actually, trees. Um, I was at Stern King Art Center a couple of years ago, and they were getting rid of their entire alley of trees. So they were uh, had already taken down dozens of them, and the last 24 were going down. And my heart just sank, like, trees? You're taking down 20, this entire row of trees? Uh, they were maple trees. So that was really bizarre, because I've been talking about the environment and talking about, I've been making tree sculptures. I didn't show you those, but... Um, so then I felt like compelled to be like, I need to work with these trees. Now I'm not, I'm not a woodworker. <laughs> so it was like, what am I going to do with trees? Um, but that was the most amazing material because though they had just died or were dying, for me, it was a living thing. So it was really hard to imagine. Um, they weren't abandoned, but they were going to get uh, rid of them because they were not uh, thriving. So the uh, ideas around environmental crisis was really hitting home. Uh, so we milled the trees and made a grand 50 foot communal sculpture, which was a picnic table. Um, so it encouraged people to um, uh, honor this tree, but it was also like a memorial. So thinking in terms of uh, tree health and looking at nature and art uh, really closely. So I'm doing a similar project with Olana with one of their dead trees. Uh, so now like a weird material has turned into a material that people are asking me whenever there's a tree that falls on a, a landscape they're like hey maybe let's call Jean to make an art project uh, so I love that um because I, really I was gonna ask that did they contact you and say oh hey Jean we have these like trees can you do something or were you like hey those you're not going to use those we can do something cool well, with Storm King, they had invited me to do a project so I could do any project I wanted. And, and I always think about what are the issues that are happening on site that I could kind of draw upon. And so this seemed like the biggest issue on, on site that I wanted to address. But having done that, Olana then really wanted this communal sculpture to arrive at their site, but their site um, condition wouldn't allow this 50 foot table because they didn't have a leveled landscape. So instead they said, well, would you want to take uh, on one of our trees that is also dying as a hemlock? Uh, so then was okay. <laughs> so it does happen in a number of different conversations. 
totally. Okay, so um, one more question, and I'm gonna ask one of Mr. Staley's questions because they're good. Actually, I'm gonna ask you two questions. You can either answer both, combine, whatever. <laughs> so anyways, okay, um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, have you always, here's a couple things. Okay, have you always intentionally made your art have a positive impact on the earth or has it just so happened to be recyclable? And what's the longest it's ever taken you to create a piece? Has COVID impacted your perspective of art, maybe digital design and the project ideas you have for the future? And have you ever worked on a piece that you thought would be impossible to put together? All of those are very big questions. Oh, amazing. Oh, I, I know I could do a whole thesis on those. Uh, well, the first, let's start with the first question. It was, um, have you always intentionally made your art to have a positive impact on the earth? Or oh just yeah, the recycling question. Yeah, I don't, in the beginning, I didn't think of it quote as recycling. I just was like, I'm an artist who has a very low paying day job and <laughs> art materials are really expensive. And what is like something I could get, but I don't have to get to the art store. <laughs> so it's about being incredibly resourceful. And I learned that from my grandmother, like, you know, um, so part of it is just being resourceful that it was like my cheapness right? <laughs> and saying, well, this is better than me going to get that thing that costs four times this. And this one's free, you know, so far part of that was just being um, resourceful about like not wanting to incur more expenses uh, and also not wanting to shop. Um, and I realized that that really pushed me into a direction of engagement, um, trying to have be in dialogue with people, you know, getting those scraps. I was talking with people who own alteration shops and that's how I was negotiating. And I realized that that skill of talking to people and convincing people um, to give me their free materials uh, was really exciting. And then they were became part of my community, very excited about what I was doing as an artist. And so willing to help. Um, so it, it led me to understand that every step of the way in my creative process could involve other people uh, and that I was enriched by these conversations I was having with them and they were too. And so this exchange was, was so uh, important, you know. Um, little did I know they were thinking like, oh, you're doing me a favor. I don't have to go to the trash. <laughs> you know, you're like my person who picks up the trash or I would have to pay like in Korea. They were like, I have to pay to cart this ceramics and they weigh this. So you know how heavy taking two tons of ceramic waste is. So they were like, great, you should take it. You know, so in some way it was me doing them a favor, but they were clearly doing me a favor. So it was a mutually beneficial exchange. And so over the time, I realized that that benefit is an uplifting message. Um, I also think my work is embedded with a question. Is it optimistic? And so there's a lot of paradox in my work. I mean, there's a lot of critique. Um, so some people might see it as optimistic and I am an optimist, but I'm also grounded in realities and looking at failures um or waste waste is a failure you know um and what were the last questions there um, um i forget the oh like what's um i think what was the, oh, the most, most difficult oh the longest project so so sometimes a museum will slate a show and they're about two years out um, into an exhibition planning. Um, so then I'll be in conversation with a curator. I'll go make a site visit. I'll start to have a conversation to see what uh, project we might do. Um, and so then we'll put it on the schedule. And then I might start, I might, I might do the research for two years out, you know, and then activate the project maybe uh, eight weeks, I'm sorry, eight months, and then go into hardcore production, like nothing else I do except work, 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 and transform this material, maybe about three months to six months to the project. Uh, that's for a very, very large scale project. Great. Well, that's like so amazing. Um, I think, where's my... In here okay i'm gonna um put you back on the gallery view so everybody can like please give jean shin an amazing round of applause 
thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Um, I hope that we can have future engagements and you can ask me more questions, uh, but good luck. Um, I love that you guys are our future artists. Um, so I and look forward to seeing your works. Today you've inspired one of our projects. We're going to, um, I've had them like collect a lot of just like uh, found objects in their house and we're gonna arrange them into like interesting compositions that could be painting, so. Oh, that's think. great. I mean, I think that other question was around the pandemic and, and, and for me, it's like, I always use the inspiration around me, you know, like the things when you can't, when you don't have options, it's like, no, just look even closer. Don't go out there. It's all around you. And, and to uh, certainly uh, your recycles, your trash can, the things that everyone's like, oh, I need to get rid of that. Well, there's your project, you know, uh, what can you do with it? Because it also comes with so much history and memory and connection to your life. And while you're saying, oh, I need to think of a great idea that's connected. Well, it's already right there in your trash. It's already right there in the things that are around you. You kept them because they have meaning, you know? And so anything can be an art material and, and to be so inspired by, um, you know, those colors, those forms, those shapes, but also to know that you can transform them into whatever your imagination um, inspires. That's like the so perfect. The perfect block. I'm so excited to see what you uh, make. So I hope uh, I get to see some of those projects really soon. Yeah, such a good reminder. Like if you're looking for inspiration, like it's right here. Yeah, I mean, it's the clothes you wear, like my projects are, <laughs> it's the, you know, the scrap that you're throwing out, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's your tea bags, you know, it's anything that you just decide is a scrap of something that I don't need. It's like, well, if you don't need it, then make art out of it, you know. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So thank much. you. My students don't leave. Don't leave my students. My SP4 people, please don't leave. <laughs> don't uh, Miss Riley, did you see yeah. my remind message? No. Okay. Remind uh, you, well, can I just explain very briefly? Yeah. My computer uh, would not turn on. It like blue screen twice and then kept loading on the HP screen. And then for a while, the keyboard was lit up, but the screen wouldn't turn on. And then my tablet was glitching out. Like, I think I sent you some videos or pictures of it on the Remind. Oh. And then after that, it wouldn't let me join on my phone. Uh, oh, wait, let me stop recording this. Oh, yeah. Um. yeah. It, would, it wouldn't let me join on my phone after that. Uh, so I had to wait till my dad 